Hello and welcome to Bar Eye's manager training series for Self Count slash Speed Count Pro clients. This is Bar Eye CEO Jamie, and we're going to run through as quick as we can through the basic requirements we have for our managers of our said Self Count system. And the idea here is just to communicate the things that we need our client managers or owners to do so that we can provide the service that you've hired us to do as best as possible. So let's jump right in here with an introduction. So, what is Bar Eye? Um, bar Eye is a service company. We all we do is inventory for bars and restaurants and our aim is to make bars more profitable by using information more intelligently. Or So the key difference with bar eye is accountability. Um, accountability we define as comparing how many ounces were poured versus how many were actually sold and this contrasts with what most bars are currently doing in the way of inventory. So when most bars take their period inventory they, they sum the value of what they have on hand and they use it to calculate their liquor cost which is normally broken down into categories just by draft beer, bottle beer, liquor, and wine. So what your liquor cost tells you is a financial measure. In accounting world, they call it cost of goods sold, and it basically tells you for every dollar of sales, how many cents do you have to spend purchasing product. So a bar which has a 20% liquor cost means that on average, for every dollar in sales they get behind the bar, they spend 20 cents purchasing product. That's all well and good. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that most bars are missing a lot of product, when you actually go to the extra detail and you compare what they're selling versus what they're actually pouring, there's typically a big difference. And so what we do is we measure that difference, uh, we call it accountability, and which is the score out of 100. And just to explain that, if you used 100 measures of product, and you, so you poured 100, but you actually sold 95, that would be a 95% score, and that would be a pretty good score. So Ultimately, we go to a higher level of detail. We precisely compare ounces rung and ounces poured. This extra detail and granularity will yield some profitability advantages because you'll be able to have a much clearer idea what's going on behind the bar. On the flip side, it also requires a higher level of attention to detail because you'll find that when there's errors, they will be glaring in our results. For instance, if you were to miscount a couple of bottles of Jack Daniels with a clipboard and liquor cost method, you probably wouldn't hardly notice it because it would hardly make a change in your liquor cost. In contrast with our system, because we're precisely, sorry, precisely comparing our Jack Daniels sales with our usage, if you've miscounted two bottles, we'll show those two bottles as missing, and we'll have to check back with you to make sure you didn't double count them. So just to say it on the front end, we want to try and be very attentive, um, get organized, and do things correctly the first time, and that will uh, cut down and improve um, the speed with which we can produce our results. So as we said, the point of bar eye is to precisely compare what's being poured versus sold. The what's been poured element, honestly, from our end is quite straightforward because all the liquor bottles and all the kegs at different bars are all the same. Um, and We're well familiar with those. So that part's easy. What is specific to your bar is the sales. And in order to figure out what you sold, we interact with your point of sale system and we actually write recipes for every single button in your point of sale system. So when you hit that Jack Daniels button, typically we'll assign 1.5 ounces of Jack Daniels and then obviously if that button was pressed a hundred times we would know that in total we should have used 150 ounces of Jack Daniels we can compare that to usage obviously it's more complicated in many cases um, lots of drinks these days in particular have multiple recipes but we go to the detail to write a recipe for every single button in the point of sale system and then as an ending point to the introduction the guiding philosophy is do it right the first time and focus on improving the results, not producing the results. What do we mean by that? Well, to start with, we're going to have a lot of moving parts. We're going to have things like the invoices we have to take care of. And at the start, there's going to be a lot of energy expended on putting in place systems and making sure we capture everything correctly. Typically, there's a bit of a ramp up period, but when we get through that ramp up in the first two months, our aim is to make it so that everything got all our ducks in a row, everything is correct, we've made those incremental updates to the point of sale system and perhaps to some of our internal processes, and then it means that after that point, we can produce accurate results that everybody is confident in quickly, without pestering you with extra questions, without having to email and find out why this product's missing, etc. And from that point forward, we can really concentrate on using the results to do better, identifying those variances and letting the numbers affect the real life and the real world and ultimately of course try and make more profits. Now that we've provided you with a brief introduction to Bar Eye, let's jump into the five sections and our first one in relates to access. So what we mean by access is providing us access to the information we need in order to complete your audit. 
as you'll find out or find out now, there's basically three steps to a uh, speed count pro or self count audit. The first step is to scan your invoices the day before. The second step is the morning to do your count and submit that completed count. And the third and final step is to look at the items contained in the variance report that we want to question and double check and return that to us. So we're going to talk a little bit about the timing of those three distinct steps. So first of all, the night before, or the day before I should say, you do your inventory count, it's important that you scan your invoices to Dropbox, and they need to be scanned by 12 p.m. noon, the business day before you count. So for most days of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, this is pretty straightforward, by midday, the day before you count. If you are one of the lucky ones that's doing your count on a Monday, and we typically re um, reserve Mondays for clients that are getting this right, um, because we tend to be very busy on a Monday, if you're doing your count on a Monday, this means that you need to scan your invoices in by midday noon on the Friday preceding the count. And a quick word, if you have a couple of pickup orders coming over the weekend, please still um, comply with that request and submit the majority of your invoices by midday noon on the Friday. And then you can always submit a couple extras either with your count or when you get them. But the idea about submitting invoices in advance is it's one of the most time consuming parts of what we do for clients and therefore submitting these in advance allows us to get this time consuming piece out of the way so that when you submit your count the following day we can turn that around very quickly to you and then when your brain and mind is still kind of in inventory mode on inventory day you'll get that quick turnaround be able to make those double checks and be done with it so it's really so that we can provide you with the best service when you submit the count and quite important so after you've submitted the count or sorry the invoices the day before next step is the day you do your count to complete the counting tool paste in your point of sale and uh, complete the communication steps and we require that that counting tool or recommend that it be submitted by 12 p.m. noon on the day you count. The reason for that is that first of all you're going to be less distracted in the morning and second of all we've got this other step to do which is to stitch all the numbers together and identify the items that could be problems and if you can submit that to us by, uh, by noon then you'll be able to handle your lunch rush when you can focus on that and in the meantime during your lunch rush we will send you your variance report. It means that hopefully by 2 p.m., when your lunch rush hopefully is finishing up, you'll get your variance report and you'll be able to send it back to us the same day by 4 p.m., hopefully in this third step, on the day you did the count. And obviously if we delay it and try and do our checking the day after or it gets into that evening, the product's going to have changed, it's going to have moved around, and it's going to get a lot more confusing. And ultimately, confusion and gray area is what we're trying to avoid, and it will reduce the effectiveness of the system. So we want to choose a day when you've got the de or enough time to dedicate, start early in the morning, do the invoices the day before. Quick word, you're going to be using Dropbox to uh, share the raw data with us. You'll notice in your Dropbox folder that we set up for you that the files are all numbered. We had numbered subfolders, and that's to keep them organized. It's important you put your files into the rect folder. In most cases, actually, they're preloaded in there for you. And another thing to mention is that with Dropbox, after you save a file, it's saved onto your hard drive, but it takes a little second for it to sync up with the cloud. So first of all, it's important your computer or laptop is connected to the internet with a good connection. And you'll see that the files will either have a little blue icon on if they still need to sync up, and then they'll turn to a green tick when it's completed. That also shows in your system tray. But it's important you understand that. If you want to look up more detail, go on Dropbox's site and they'll explain that in detail but it's important you understand that because if you save it and then close the laptop without it being synced up what will happen is it will be saved in your hard drive but we won't have access to it and you'll get an email from us saying hey we need that information so this sort of stuff we're trying to move past and get things to happen um, smoothly and then finally as we said there's three steps after each of these steps after you've scanned your invoices after you've done your account and after you've completed the variance report you need to send us a notification email to let us know that you've completed that step so we can get to work for you. And there's two methods to do that. It can just be a one-liner, say, hey, I'm done with my count, invoices are in. Either send an email to sc, short for self-count, at bari.com, or send a text to that number here, 303-219-0196. Section 2, Invoices. In the last section, we touched a little bit on the importance of scanning your invoices. But we're going to go into a little bit more detail here. And the reason for this is that missing invoices and missing information not being written down on invoices is probably the number one challenge we have at Bar I. I've said it many times, if we had a dollar for every time we were missing a piece of paper and invoice, we would be millionaires by now. So 
want to focus a little bit on this and just talk about how um, to handle this all correctly. So as we mentioned in the last section, it's important that you scan your invoices for us the day before uh, you do your inventory count. And if you're doing your inventory on a Monday, that means on Friday. But in all cases, by 12 p.m. noon, that allows us to get that work done so that we can turn around your count very fast and provide better service to you. So in addition to simply scanning the invoices, when you receive those deliveries and those invoices, it's important you check these in line by line. This is something that is done honestly sporadically in bars. Often the delivery driver will come, drop off a stack of product, he'll ask you to sign for it, and someone will just sign for it saying yes, there was delivery, without actually engaging as to whether what is listed on the invoice is physically at the bar. So when we say line by line, we mean picking up the invoice when the delivery driver gives it to you. If it's the top item is 12 bottles of Jack Daniels, you need to go to the stack of product and physically confirm that the 12 bottles are there. Tick that item and go to the next item. And if it says, you know, two bottles of Grand Marnier, again, confirm those two bottles are there and to complete that for each item on the list. We'd like you to mark with a tick or your initial each line item. And when you're finished, sign, the, sign at the bottom and that, again, removes some uncertainty because if we know that someone has checked this in and it definitely came into the building, if those products are missing, we don't have any questions. And just to say it, we've done this for many, many bars for a few years now. I've never seen an error that was in favor of a bar, and I've seen many that were in favor of the distributor. So, for example, you'll get sent one bottle, you'll get charged for a case. So it's important you do that step. The other thing that's important for our self-count clients is that we're not physically at your bar on a recurring basis. So you're going to be scanning these invoices to Dropbox. It's important you establish it's very basic but a simple system so that you know which invoices have already been scanned and which invoices have not been scanned. You, know, you can either do this at the time as soon as they come in, scan them into the folder, mark them, or some people prefer just to keep them in the stack, check them in, and then at the end of the week, the day before, they're going to do their inventory. They'll scan them all. And it's important, what we typically recommend is to write bar I and circle it on the top of the invoice once you've scanned it. And by having just a very basic system like that will ensure we don't get double scans and we don't miss invoices and we're not chasing after those silly pieces of paper. The easiest way, if you have any adjustments or things that aren't correct, such as errors where they didn't deliver what they said, you sent something back because they sent you something you didn't want or they subbed something, the easiest way to communicate this is to write it directly in the invoice at the time when you're checking in the product. Um, a word on removals, it's often the case that an owner might buy a case of wine or that some product is taken home for another reason or perhaps it's sent to the kitchen. If you mark it there and then, it will be helpful to us and we won't have to chase after that product because we know it's not included in the bar inventory. Conversely, if you don't communicate that, we're going to show that we're missing a, a case of wine we'll actually have to go to additional work because we have to probably enter that new wine into the system and then it, we sort of do all the work, find out that actually it's not really missing at all and we've just wasted our time. So it's, it's really appreciated and it's much more efficient if when you can, you just mark any adjustments onto the invoices, mark it that it wasn't here, that it didn't come, we sent it away somewhere. Also we mentioned previously, but after you've done your invoices, important step is to notify us, let us know they're all ready to go so we can get to work for you. And there's two ways to do that. Just send a quick one-liner to either selfcount at barai.com or send us a text message at 303-219-1096. Another thing we recommend is having a communication worksheet behind the bar. You can actually print your own off. and um, We've put a blank copy in there for you into your shared Dropbox folder. And the nice thing about using a worksheet, a single sheet of paper rather than a logbook, is that when you then go to scan your invoices, you can just grab that communication worksheet from behind the bar and scan it along with your invoices, meaning that it's pretty quick and it's part of the process. If you're in the habit of using a bar log, it might be a little bit harder to scan those. But alongside your invoices, grab your communication worksheet and scan those. That will mean that everyone can share in the responsibility of writing down the adjustments on the communication sheet, and it's quick and easy to communicate those to us. Final note, and I mentioned this previously, but don't delay your invoices for one or two. We need them by 12 p.m. noon the day before. Give us what you have to that point, and if you have an invoice or two coming because of pickup orders, you can submit those with the count. But we want to get the body, the main body of this work done in advance. Section 3, Communication. So in the previous section, we talked in detail about how invoices tell us what product was delivered, and it's important to check those. The next thing is that when we use product, most of the time, we'll know that the product has been used because it will be run into the point-of-sale system. 
So the point of sale system is very much the default way to communicate. Obviously that requires that the point of sale system is set up correctly and we'll have more on that later. But generally speaking, if you receive product via invoices which are correct and checked, and then every time you use product it's running to the point of sale, that's the end of the story. What we're talking about with communication is when either of those two things doesn't happen, if you either receive product without an invoice or product leaves or is used without being precisely rung into the point of sale, we need to know about it. So when you can't ring it into the point of sale correctly, the best thing to do is to write it down on the communication worksheet which you'll have placed behind the bar or if you prefer maybe you already have a booklet you put behind the bar and use it. And I say that because there's a lot of bars that have a communication log and they get two notes in there per month. If we only have two notes in the log on the communication sheet each week or so, there's either two, one or two things going on. Most typically it's because it's simply not being used and we're missing a whole bunch of things that should be written down. The other possibility is your point of sale is set up so brilliantly and your staff is so on board that they're doing everything correctly. The latter, I'm sorry to say, is less common. So get in the habit of if you're not sure about something, it's better to have too many communication notes than too few. Last section we discussed this, but we should note things on invoices when possible because they're there right at the time that we need to make the adjustment. And if not, the next best way is to write down on the communication worksheet behind the bar. And then the final best method is there is a communication tab actually within the self-count software. And you can also note adjustments on that. The reason I don't like that method as much is because it relies on you remembering what adjustments there are to be made. You have to save those up until the day you do your count. The advantage of using a communication worksheet behind the bar is at the time when you ring something up strangely or you need to make an adjustment, you can note it and then you scan it along with your invoices and it's a much more effective, easier to use system. Another element of communication is that we talked about signing off on recipes, but we need to have exact recipes in our system and in turn those recipes and portion sizes need to be communicated to the staff. We will go through that in detail. If your staff doesn't know that your standard liquor pour size is an ounce and a half, the chance of them correctly pouring it is pretty low. So communication with your staff is also important here to get them on the page of what we're doing here with Bar I. Mention that, but communication notes should be written at the time of the adjustment so you don't have to remember them. Um, if you get verbaled 15 different things over a busy shift, you will never remember it. So encourage your staff to write them down and that shares everybody in the responsibility of getting this right. And as we mentioned, if you're a new client or an incoming new manager, it's also important that you review the recipes we're using to calculate your numbers and sign off on them, A, to ensure they're correct, and B, so that you know they're correct, so that when your staff are asking you about this, you have confidence, and uh, ultimately, being confident in the results will mean that they're more effective because we'll act on them more. So additional details. When we have the information we need, we can provide the best service for our clients, save manager time, and ultimately, be more profitable and do the best service we can. Missing information wastes significant time, both ours and yours, and reduces the overall effectiveness of the system in a number of ways. So let me just quickly explain here. We used the example earlier about a case of wine being taken or purchased for the owner and they send it away. The trouble with us is, as a professional inventory company, obviously we're expected to be correct, and so anytime something is off and strange looking, we have to double check our work before we come to you and say, hey, what's up with this? In a case where it's something which just could have been written down, it's rather frustrating. So it's really appreciated if you can write this information down at the time. And like I said, in this case, more is less. If in doubt, write a note. If it's not that relevant, we can always ignore it. As we said, most critically, invoices need to be in all um, available in one place in Dropbox in advance of counting the day before. And then any other exceptions which affect accountability numbers must be communicated ideally by marking your invoices by writing on your communication worksheet, next best, or if not, in the communication sheet of the self-count tool. So just for the sake of being extra detailed, let's run through a couple of examples where we need to have communication written down. First one is if the product delivered doesn't match what's written on the invoice, obviously that requires you are checking the product delivered against the invoice, and we went into detail on that earlier. Next one is if product arrives without an invoice. Technically, this is not allowed in most states, but the reality is it happens. Sometimes your distributors will give you a half bottle or after a tasting, you'll keep it. Um, and it's useful to write that down. This is a big one, private parties. So the ideal way for us to have a private party is to ring up all the drinks individually. And then if you're not charging them per drink, you can comp off those drinks. Don't void them because you'll erase that record, but comp the amount off so that you can 
have that record in the point of sale system but not have to take that money from the, uh, the clients. And another upside of the why you should ring in private party sales individually drink by drink even if you're not charging them that way is so you can compare what it was you charged your, uh, your private party versus what they spent on a retail basis per client. You know if the average um, bar spend per person was 12 bucks and you charged them 10 that's probably fine because it's a you know a sort of a scale economies of, of a group. Equally if they used $15 each and you charged them 10 you're probably missing missing out there. Another two ones again technically not allowed but it happens so useful to let us know. If you're in the habit of perhaps lending or borrowing product from nearby bars if you run out it's important that be written down and obviously we need it to happen both ways. If you lend it out we need to have it written down and that's also important so that you can remember to uh, collect it when they return that product to you. We like to call this jokingly research and development but it's not uncommon to be given products or for people to take product home to test it. Obviously that's important to do, it's part of the fun actually of getting free samples of work in this industry but again if you're removing this product and it's not being rung, rung into the point of sale we please need to know about it, either ring it up ideal or write it down um, if you can't do that. Another one, a lot of the times if you send back a bad keg, it might take a week or so for us to get a return credit amongst your invoices. So again, it's always appreciated if you can write a note if you return product. Another one is product subs. If you ring one product but pour another, you know, example on a busy Friday night, maybe you run out of Jack Daniels and you start pouring Jim Beam. If you do that a lot of times, we're going to have one product up and the other down. So again, it would be grateful if you could say, hey, we run out of Jack Daniels or we run rung as the other. Another one would be new recipes. Um, there's also the opportunity to put this into the communication sheet, but most times we will know what the uh, button is. For instance, if you add a you know, Jack Rocks button, we'll know your standard Rocks pour is perhaps two ounces, and we'll be able to write that recipe without consultation. However, if you add that new button top shelf marg, obviously that doesn't indicate the specific tequila used or what liqueur or triple set you're using, so it's appreciated if you can write that down for us. And then finally, we want to try and get get rid or not get rid of but stop using your open buttons because they obviously are open they don't indicate what's being poured you have no control over what's being poured and what's being charged what we're going to do is presume that those buttons are a single serving so if you ring up open wine but it's for a whole bottle then it creates a problem because we'll just assign probably six ounces when actually you serve the whole bottle one way around that might be to add an open wine bottle button so that you can ring up open wine glass and open wine bottle separately We've talked a little bit about point of sale, but here we're going to go into a little bit more detail. As we mentioned, obviously the point of sale is how we account for what was sold, and we're going to need to match up sales against usage. So we're going to deep dive and just explain this in more detail. So the number one rule or the starting point is that every pour has its own button. We sometimes use the expression one, one drink, one button, meaning that every single drink has its own dedicated button. And just a point of clarification here, is that it needs to identify both the product and the specific size of the pour. So if you're using a button Jack Daniels to do a regular cocktail perhaps an ounce and a half and then it's also used when you're pouring a rocks pour which is larger we have a problem there partly because you're not charging the correct amount for the extra pour and partly because there's no precise record of how much of that product was sold. Another important one is that these point of sale buttons need to be added before any new product is sold. And this is just a silly one really, if you're going to sell the product eventually you're going to have to add a button for it. It makes things a lot cleaner and tidier if you do that beforehand. So with a little bit of forethought and organization and honestly if you're bringing in products without any forethought and organization we have a problem with that. So very important if you have considered that you're going to choose to bring on this new product it's very important you put a point of sale button into the system before it goes onto the floor. Um, otherwise there's the chance that people don't know how to charge for it correctly you're just going to create a bad overall experience and possibly cost yourself money by undercharging. So anytime we have any exceptions, if you're ringing things in in a way that doesn't identify what was poured, again it needs to identify both the product being poured and the size, we would please appreciate very much um, some communication and ideally we'd actually update the point of sale system, make some changes so that situation doesn't happen in the future. So this is a good aim to have, um, I need to explain this, but we want to reduce our unknown rings down below 1% of sales within two months. So first of all, what is an unknown ring? Well, sometimes there are occasions in your point of sale setup where we know the quantity of product which was sold, but we're not able to determine 
which specific product it was that was sold. An example is if you use generic rocks modifiers. So at most bars, because the point of sale is programmed in a kind of not an optimal way, when you ring up a Jack Daniels on the rocks, you first press the Jack Daniels button, and that indicates to us an ounce and a half of product is being poured. And then you press a generic modifier, which perhaps adds two or three dollars. And that modifier will just be called rocks or on the rocks. The problem there is that we know that we're pouring an extra half ounce of product in most cases, but when we look at the aggregated weekly sales report, it will tell us how many times that rocks modifier was pressed, not how many of those times related to Jack Daniels, how many was Jim Beam, how many was Johnny Walker Black, and therefore we'll have to just do an ounce and a half, or half an ounce, sorry, of product, and we'll call that product unknown liquor, so that we correctly account for the amount, but obviously we can't specifically line it up to the, to the product. What that does is create gray area and questions in our reports. So we want to pragmatically and incrementally make changes to the point of sale report so that we can get away from that situation. And we provide complimentary advice to do that. So a few additional details on the point of sale. Bar I tracks usage of every product you carry and prepares and compares the usage to the sales. This requires an exact record of sales be available. So as we said, there's going to be, in most cases, you're going to have this correct. There's probably a few occasions where this isn't correct. A recent one we had with a new product or a new bar was that they had all their drafts correctly named in there by by draft name. So you had, you know, you rang up a Coors Light, you rang up a Bud Light. The one thing was that they had a second size of beer. They did 23 ounce larger beers. And when you wanted to upgrade a customer to a larger beer, you just pressed 23 ounce beer and it added a fixed charge. Again, the issue there is twofold. One, we're not charging a, an appropriate amount for the extra beer because we're charging the same amount for the extra ounces of Bud Light as we are for a, a craft beer, which probably costs almost twice as much. And then the other issue is, again, we don't have a precise record of exactly what those extra ounces of beer sold in 23 ounce, whether they were Bud Light or other items. So the worst case of using or not having a complete sales record is to use call well buttons. Call well premium, super premium is the typical way it's done. That is very, very costly to your bar business. Uh, I can't emphasize enough. If you're doing that at your bar currently, we need to talk. You have serious problems. Um, you're really not using your multi-thousand dollar point of sale system in the way it was designed, and you're probably costing your business quite a lot of money. A less extreme example that we've discussed is, is those generic modifiers. Most commonly, that's a rocks double martini, sometimes a Manhattan modifier. And again, the problem there is we press those generic modifiers regardless of the product being served. It charges a fixed amount, which is silly because the product varies in cost, and it doesn't provide us a record. Also, open buttons means that probably you're using open button because there isn't a correct way to ring it into the system. So again, you can fix that simply by, by addressing that issue. So we provide complimentary advice on this. If you have any questions, we're more than willing to explain how it is that we need to make specific changes, and your account manager will work with you specifically. And again, we try and put a two-month limit on this. We don't want this to drag on. It's very tedious, honestly, and boring, some of these updates we have to make into your point of sale system. It might require a couple of hours of office time sat making these programs. However, once it's done, it's done. And your business and uh, the effectiveness of bar I reports will benefit for the rest of time going forward. So it's not too exciting, but we really appreciate if you can do that work up front, it will uh, yield benefit on the back end to everyone. I mentioned it before, but we follow the principle of one drink, one button. If you look up this article online, you can actually get a link or just do a search for one drink, one button, and that explains in more detail what we're going over here. Again, we mentioned private parties, but they are they do have the ability to ruin an entire cycle. So let's just explain the ideal way. When you have a private party, regardless if you're charging the customer per drink, many times you sell a private party and it's you know $10 a head. So in some respects, you don't care what they drink because you're just going to give it to them. Either way, it's good to ring up those drinks, drink by drink. It reinforces that idea that we're careful about ringing things up. And then later on, if you comp that and therefore wipe out the dollars, do not void it because you'll erase all record of that tab. But if you later comp it, that will mean that you're not missing or you don't have to tie up the dollars, but there'll be that exact record of precisely what drinks were sold, meaning you don't have to record or remember what you were serving during the private party. So that's absolutely the best way to do it. When you have a private party, ring up the drinks individually and comp them after the event. I tell you another reason why that's beneficial is if you sell your party at $10 a head and you track how much booze was actually used at retail, you'll be able to figure out if you're over or under selling your parties because if the average 
you know, dollars spent at retail by your customers was perhaps $12, you might be okay. We gave them a 20% discount because it was a group function. If it creeps up to be $14 a person, we might start to think about charging them a little bit more. Final word on point of sale is point of sale systems get upgraded. They have a new version. Sometimes you'll choose a new one. Anytime a significant change to your point of sale system like that occurs, it would be really beneficial to us if you can tell us. The reason being is if we know in advance, often we can make sure that the new system is programmed in a way that there will be a seamless transition, uh, make sure that the button descriptions are the same, and either way we will be able to minimize the extra work and therefore related charges to this. And another thing to say is that because we're an independent business and we work with you know, a lot of different bars, we will have an opinion on which point of sale systems work well for you. I always say I think that all of them to the, for the most part can do what you need them to do and so the quality of local service is really important. But overall, we'll have an opinion. So if you have questions and you want an independent viewpoint on, are we going to choose this point of sale? Are we going to choose this one? We can always do that. And obviously, we have no vested interest in which point of sale you choose. Um, so you'll get good independent advice. Woohoo, we got there. Final piece. Uh, thank you for your patience in listening through. I understand this is not terribly exciting. Um, we're going to deal in section five with the very exciting topic of organization and counting accuracy. So we actually originally called this organization and then we wanted to explain a little bit. The reason that organization is so important is it will save you a lot of time and also when you're counting it will help you to be more accurate. Most bars, are, to be honest, are not terribly well organized. They tend to be a sort of laissez-faire kind of attitude where things sort of end up where they end up rather than there being any conscious thought. What we found is that it always makes sense to be better organized, to have a bit of thought to where you put things and it will yield a lot of advantages. So. Here's where we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. So a few sort of basic high-level rules. Everything should have a dedicated place. We don't care where anything is kept as long as it's always kept in that same place. Um, there should be some forethought. You know, for instance, when you're choosing what liquors go behind the bar, if you have special deals, they should be front and center on your pyramid and you're presented to your um, customers. Again, if you're just letting things happen, um, you're missing out because it's going to slow things down or it's going to not help you sell more of the product you want to sell. But in all cases, have some think, thought about it and perhaps get your bartenders involved because if they're involved in choosing the sort of organizational system, they'll be more likely to stick with it. So next on again, this is anal, but it really helps. If you've got different staff moving through and you establish a place, the trouble is that no one knows what that place is. The only way to get around that is to label those places. So everything from your well to your liquor backups to your storage area we think it's a really good idea to actually get the label out and label it so that it can always be put back in the right place without having to explain the system to people. Obviously, if we are choosing places and labeling them, it's important to keep things in their place, so you need to make sure that that's enforced. Also, you should organize your inventory in a way that you can count it accurately without excessive moving around. If everything is stacked on top of each other, and understand you have restrictions and what space you have available, but you want to organize things as well as possible so that you can count them accurately without having to move things around which will slow you down an awful lot. We've even gone as far as finding secondhand shelving units and giving those or providing those to um, to bars. Generally speaking a big problem is with your limited space if you don't have any shelving units in there you're going to have a problem keeping things organized. So with your limited space um, try and be proactive and try and keep things organized and if if, if and when necessary a few shelves or a few shelving units obviously can have often can have a big big effect on um, how things how things look. Easy one, most people are aware of this, it doesn't always happen in real life, but we shouldn't store product in broken cases because it's easy to miscount them. Generally, if you open the case, you should break it down and put those bottles directly onto the shelf. Ordering our uh, each report or each audit we complete is accompanied by an order guide which helps us to hopefully spend a little time on ordering by having some automation behind the system. But if you are simply in the habit of ordering, you know, to fill up the shelves or to, you know, out of a fear of running out of product, you're probably over ordering. And most bars do over order. They carry too much product on hand. So we recommend again having par levels, either using our order guides par levels or setting par levels for yourself so that you have an idea about what you need to be purchasing. And, you know, a common example would be Make a decision which products you're going to purchase by the case because perhaps you get a discount in some states and then which products are going to be just purchased as single bottles. 
we're going to get into more detail here in a second but rather than just think about more selection is better we're going to go into detail here but we want to reach a balance between the selection which has benefits and also simplicity which has obvious benefits as well so looking at some additional details our view is the is that the best run bars have a specific place for everything. It's not how often a lot of bars are run, but it's how the best run bars are. So the design of our inventory system is based on this belief. Sometimes we get objections, well, you want everything in the same place because that's how your system works. It's actually not the case. The reason we designed our system to have a specific place is that we realize that when you're counting, if everything has a specific place, operationally the bar will run better. You will be much, much faster when you count inventory. And let's be honest, no one likes counting inventory. You'll also be more accurate because you have to change things around less. There'll be less, you know, uh, sifting through a, a clipboard to find the right product. If the software matches uh, the order of products in real life, you can really run through bars pretty quickly. Just to throw it out there, when we are working at bars that are well organized, we can count up to 500 items an hour. But it requires said that there's some organization and thought behind things. Um, if you do a search for Mison Plus and Bar I, you'll read an article about it. It goes into a little bit more detail. But basically, putting things in their specific place, it's a French expression. It's typically applied in the kitchen. Um, it's not so frequently applied behind the bar, but it makes just as good sense. When you have a set position for everything, everything in its place is literally what that means. But you're going to get these advantages. You're going to produce better service for your customers, more efficient ordering, because you can see when you've run out of something. You won't have two bottles of the same white wine open in your cooler. And of course, you'll spend less time taking inventory. If you have any questions about best practice organization, call us up. We're happy to provide some complimentary advice to you. And again, that will pay you back um, in the long run with uh, reduced time um, spent taking inventory. And then you know, back to that point about labeling things, a lot of people like to use label makers. They work great. They produce these pretty looking labels. The downside of them is that often you find they run out of batteries and then you run out of the ribbon that is needed to print labels, meaning that you suddenly don't have the ability to, to label. So in most cases, we like to use just uh, some scotch tape and a Sharpie. The reason being because it's so quick and easy to make up labels that way. And it also is something you typically have on hand, so you won't run out of it. Um, and then if those labels are going to be visible to your customers, you might want to keep this. You know, so I've seen bars use black tape and a silver Sharpie. And if you've got someone with nice handwriting, this actually looks pretty cool. And again, think of the impression with the customer. Okay, maybe you don't want them seeing your anal organized labels, but gen generally speaking, if you give them the impression that you're a bar that has thought and care taken to how you order it, you'll probably give them the impression that you're going to provide thought and care into how you make their drinks and how you prepare their food. So to say this is just for the benefit of internal operations is not true. So final word of the series here is on simplicity. Um, there are obvious advantages to having a lot of selection. There are also operational disadvantages. Um, those include if you have more products, staff will know less about the products you do have. You will complicate everything in your business from ordering, taking inventory, doing your liquor inventory to count, or sorry, calculating your liquor cost, storing things and also training staff. You'll also get less volume discounts because ultimately you're probably going to do a certain amount of volume. And if you split it up by 100 products, rather than by 50, you're going to do half as much of every product, meaning that you can get less volume discounts. You can order less things by the case or negotiate less good discounts. And also, if you've got lots of selections, you're going to have a lot of half bottles sitting around. and You're going to tie up a lot of money in inventory. We actually like to track this. It's a We take this as a ratio of what you have on hand compared to your sales. I can tell you that well-run bars keep their inventory below four times what they go through on a weekly basis. And in many cases, they can get it below three. It's not unusual for us to start with bars that are more like 15 times. We found a bar the other week where they were able to save $24,000 they have on inventory in hand simply by tightening up their par and ordering system. In general, we don't think that most bars strike this balance correctly. Um, again, it's a balance because as I said there's benefits to, to selection, there's benefits to simplicity. So we want to think about this actively. We recommend that we set guidelines. There's a lot of factors that will mean that you'll tend to keep on increasing your selection, not least the fact that your distributors are keen for you to carry more of their products. But we want you to think about this from a business perspective. What we mean by that is how can we make more money? Um, again, we recommend setting guidelines because there's always going to be a tendency for the product selection to grow. And the only way to keep it is to have a sort of, you know, we only have 
150 liquor bottles or less, then when you're at 150 your distributor comes in, you can say, well, actually, we're at max. We need to use up a few more, and it puts you in a better position. Note your free sales. Um, this doesn't apply, or sorry, your free product. This doesn't apply in many states, but in Colorado here it does. When you get free product, it's not really free at all. It's on the house. Um, really what they're trying to do is make you buy more of their products. In all cases, it's beneficial you negotiate with your distributors. Don't let them just give you what they want because that's for their own aims and benefits. For instance, they might give you a free bottle of product when you order a case, and then sometimes they'll offer you a free different flavor, and you don't want that flavor. So maybe they can't. Um, that's the only deal they're able to offer. But if you don't ask, you'll never find out. And if you're being cognizant and asking your distributor, they'll be less likely to try and use you as a dumping ground for product they're trying to get rid of or to meet their sales quotas. Now that we've explained in detail the five elements of the manager training, let's take a look here on the first page of a bar I report and show you where you can track your progress on these five items. So you see down here at the bottom right, we score each of these five elements from zero to two. So maximum score obviously is five times two is 10. So these guys are doing very well. You see they're scoring nine out of 10. And if you look actually at the top of their accountability graph, this is a new client of ours that started a couple of months ago. And you can see they've really dialed things in and their accountability score has risen from 76 at the start to 96 at the last, most recent cycle. And actually their liquor cost during the period reduced by over 3%. But said, looking on page one of a standard bar report, you'll be able to track your progress and know where it is that you need to make improvements.